Hello, uh, and welcome to another of the Nautical Institute webinar series. Uh, I am David Petraco. I'm from the Nautical Institute headquarters here in a very soggy London, and I'm being joined by Mr. Surendra Lingaretti, um, who is, joins us from Hyderabad in India. Uh, good morning good or good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. How are you? Good. Right. Now, before I continue, I would just like to go through a few house rules. Okay, this is an interactive session. Uh, you will have noticed that you do not have uh, voice or video, but you do have a keyboard. Um, on your screen, you have a little control panel, and on that control panel, you have a little white arrow in an orange field uh, that will expand or compress your control panel. And once your control panel is open, you can do a number of things. There is a function to ask questions. So type those in and they will appear in front of me and uh, I can address them to our guest. Uh, try to keep them short and concise, otherwise you make it very difficult for me, but I will do my best. Um, we also have a number of handouts that you can download for further information. Following the end of this webinar, um, you will be uh, given the option of doing a little um, feedback uh, test for us. Uh, we, I would appreciate if you did it. It only takes a couple minutes. We'll ask you how we did and what we can do better, and also ask what other subjects you might like us to cover in the future. And you will also, uh, after a couple hours after this session uh, ends, uh, you'll get an email thanking you for your attendance and letting you know that um, a recording will be made on available on our YouTube channel. And you will also have a link to a certificate of attendance for CPD. Now, back to the subject in hand. Startups. Um, Mr. Lingaretti uh, will, will talk to us about startups. You'll probably have seen them in the news. Uh, some people think that they're technology. Some people think that they're a way of thinking, probably a little bit of both. Uh, some people think that they're small, uh, somebody in their back room. Um, but if you look at this headline in, in, in the news just recently, um they're looking at a market of 850 billion dollars in just a couple of years and um uh, they're saying that this will be led in the short term at least by startups and tech driven businesses so a fascinating field here um and i certainly am looking forward to learning a lot more about it and while i hand over to um, Surendra, I'd just like to introduce him. Um, he is the founder and CEO of Voltio Maritime. Uh, Voltio Maritime helps shipping companies build their digital future collaboratively. And Surendra believes that responsible application of technology will help the world become a smaller, smarter, and better place. So, uh, Surendra, on that, welcome and please. Share your thoughts with us. Thanks, David. Uh, good afternoon, good morning, good evening, everyone. I think people are joining from everywhere. So first of all, thank you so much for this opportunity. Captain Sajid, the gentleman from India had facilitated this conversation. I hope he's joined. If not, uh, I've been just told that he's sailing in uh, South China Sea, so he may not be able to uh, be with us. But but it, it's it's indeed a great honor for me to, to be able to uh, be speaking at this webinar. Uh, one, because of the commitment that I've seen uh, seafarers and every day we hear about working styles during this pandemic and how they've been uh, they've been operating and and helping this world move, thrive as well as survive. Uh, so so first of all, uh, big big regard for everything that you guys do. One second. So let me see if I can. 
Are you able to see the screen change, uh, David? Uh, yep, we, we've got okay. it. All right, so uh, as David introduced, my name is Surendra. I'm the founder and CEO of, uh, of Volteo Maritime, but I'd like to call myself a techie who's just fallen in love with Maritime. And the reason why I say that is uh, because for the first 15 plus years uh, in my professional career, I spent uh, time writing software. And the last five plus, I've been uh, instrumental uh, in driving digital transformation in Asia-Pac region, working with large enterprises. Some of them are in maritime, but uh, a lot of them are not. Uh, but the fundamental focus is that we look at how technology and processes can amalgamate into each other to fundamentally produce digital experiences, because that's what we're all after, is to, is to use technology to, to identify ways to work better in our uh, in our professional lives. I'm also an engineer by profession. I did chemical engineering in India and then went to the US uh, to, do, to, to do my master's. And after that, I just started working. Maritime industry to me happened more by accident than by design. Uh, in 2017, one of my key assignments uh, was to get involved with a bulk cargo port, uh, essentially to understand their business processes, to identify how to build software for them. And this was a port that was absolutely ridden with paper, Excel and WhatsApp were the best software friends. During that assignment, I met this gentleman that you see on, this, on, on the screen, and uh, he was the head of ports. He was uh, almost due to retire. And I'd asked him a very, very simple question. I, I said, for me to appreciate what you do on a daily basis, I'd like to know your typical day. So I said, sir, please help me understand what you do during the day. Uh, he he, take, he took these glasses, he, he wore glasses, he took these glasses down, put it on our table, and he looked at me and he said, for the last 20 years, all I've felt is I've read paper. And that to me was a moment of epiphany, meaning this industry was certainly in, in, in need of technology that could really transform the way day-to-day -day was conducted. And fortunately, since 2017, we've been engaged with this uh, large bulk cargo port. And after two years, we've been able to transform it to almost 80% paperless. And, and that entire journey got into uh, as experience for that when we applied to this program called Eastern Pacific Shipping Accelerator based out of Singapore. Uh, so this was in November of 2019 that uh, we were selected as one of the startups to be part of that program. Uh, there were nine startups that were selected out of a list of about 500 applicants. And fortunately, that gave me an opportunity to understand the other side of the maritime sector, where previously I'd worked in ports. I now had an opportunity to work with seafarers who were actively sailing, look at the operational side of how work gets done on ships. And in this process, I'd met this uh, amazing gentleman, my name Chief Officer Hilev, who's working for Eastern Pacific Shipping. I was fortunate enough uh, to get on, on a vessel that was sailing between Singapore and Malaysia. And, and it was my first voyage. Uh, and I, I sat down with him to, to have multiple cups of coffee and, and understand, essentially empathize with the way work was getting done on ships. Several of you here are obviously professional seafarers and you might find this image to be fairly familiar. Every vessel during remote audits or to have to do your job on a daily basis requires you to document. It's been estimated that uh, about 100 million hours purely go into regulatory compliance. There are about a billion sheets of paper that is, this industry produces. And having to comply with regulation means a lot of paperwork, a lot of burden. And if you drop the ball, there's also a risk of a lot of fines and penalties. When I looked at all of it, we came up with this platform that would allow you to look at how work can be done through tablet interfaces. So we've, we've just launched this platform called Wayship, and it's a digital workspace for, for collaborative compliance. And the reason why I bring up all the story is because I'm personally a beneficiary of the startup ecosystem. I've tremendously benefited of, of, the, of the entire ecosystem that was made available to me. The seafarers that made themselves available to help me understand the industry. And now I'm fortunate enough to be part of your ecosystem to be able to offer a solution that hopefully will be able to help you in your daily lives. But today it's not about me, it's about you. What we're going to talk about in this, in this session is, is to look at how 
seafarers can take advantage of the current situation where innovation is being asked as a necessity for every maritime enterprise to thrive and how startups can play a critical role in pushing that envelope of innovation in the maritime industry so i'll cover the following ones i'll 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 tell you what is a startup how to be in one or potentially even start one by yourselves how can you develop an eye for innovation because when we start working on a daily basis we tend to either accept the fate as is or we don't necessarily question as to what's going on so i'll have some tips about how you can start looking on a daily basis for ideas to innovate i'll also have some examples about which startups that i'm aware of with who are challenging the status quo briefly i'll share some ecosystem that is available to you in abundance that you can utilize to help you succeed and most importantly for any organization and any enterprise collaborations a very very big factor and you can rely upon your colleagues as well as the existing ecosystem to to ride this wave so let's start with the first fundamental question what is a startup anyway in my view a startup is simply a legal entity formed to pursue repeatable and scalable business now this is a very simplified version of what it is but there are a couple of key focus areas that that i want to emphasize upon the first is repeatability any time a business is created you cannot be happy with having one customer if you do it that way then it typically ends up being a project it's not necessarily a product or a service so the primary element of any startup should be solving a particular problem that can be repeatably applied to individuals or enterprises and in exchange of providing that solution they give you a certain amount of money or in in certain cases like a non government profit uh, enterprise it's it's usually considered as a service the second is it has to be scalable repeatability ensures scalability as well if you're having a lot of repeat customers which means that it is appreciated by several enterprises and individuals and it, uh, it allows you to scale and for scalability sometimes because of the way the enterprise the startup start they may need money to accelerate that scalability and that's where funding comes into place but i don't use the word money here because money is only a rocket fuel that helps a startup grow but fundamental nature of any startup should be that it pursues something that is going to be repeatable and scalable on a regular basis so that you can build a business that is going to grow and solve a certain amount of problems w one way to think about it is a lot of enterprises which are successful now have a lot of potentially money at their disposal and they're trying to do utilize that money and convert it into knowledge that's that's what typically an r&d institution is is you have a whole bunch of money you know that there is a particular problem to be solved and by applying that money to a problem you generate knowledge and after you generate knowledge you can potentially think about building a business out of it whereas a startup is actually the other way around a group of individuals who've been passionate who've been working on this uh, in this particular sector or have identified a particular a particular set of problems would like to use their knowledge solve those problems and turn that into money so so r&d versus innovate innovation slightly is different from a startup perspective but the fundamental nature of a startup revolves around four key things the first is you'd have to have a problem or an idea to 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 think about is what is it that you're solving in the first place every successful startup in the world has definitely identified first a problem worthy enough to solve or an idea that is worthy enough to to uh, embark upon so that the solution that you provide is going to be helpful to millions of people now it's important to think about how you generate these problems and ideas on a daily basis and we'll talk about that in the in a few slides from now once you have a problem or an idea identified you'd have to think about how can i solve that particular problem how can i provide a service that is going to be repeatable and scalable and people are going to pay money for it and once you produce this solution or or, or service you'd have to have a great amount of resources and that comes with a core set of people to begin with one 
to produce that solution or service that you're that, that you're uh, addressing first and then in order to grow you'd have to hire people that are like-minded that believe in the purpose that you're able to uh, build this enterprise or build this startup and accelerate in the future by bringing all the elements together which is the problem statement which is the solution that you're providing bringing in passionate people into the organization managing money lot of enterprises so a lot of startups fail at the execution bit it's not that you can have a great idea and you'll be extremely successful the most key factor of of any startup to succeed is that you'd have to have a great idea you'd have to have good people to begin with that allow you to thrive in that constricted and restricted environments and be able to use all that mechanisms to execute to plan and to pivot wherever necessary so that when corrections need to be made you're nimble enough to to make those adjustments and uh, and, and go further each of these boxes are are a webinar in itself because they go in depth in terms of understanding but but in terms of one principle a fundamental idea is basically your view of what could be better so think of it as if that i particularly have this problem if i had the resources to solve this particular problem how would that end state look like for example if you have safety issues within within your uh, within your vessels or within your enterprise what would i do to solve those problems is one step but after you have solved the problems how would that look like how would it change the way you work that is a very very critical way to imagine what an idea could lead into a solution and if you're able to encapsulate this then you can go and share it with others to be able to understand whether they feel the same way as what you do and 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 validate that thought process that you have so let's let's try to dig deeper into this how do you develop an eye to identify problems and this is always a challenge especially when we are sort of accepting our daily life as is we are we are, we are busy with our our, uh, our work styles we don't necessarily look for it because we've been doing this day in and day out the first and foremost as henry ford previously said is when you tend to complain about things or when you're frustrated about certain things that's the first telltale sign that this potentially could be an area for you to invest and focus upon so that it can be a, a solution that you can provide or it could at least be something that you could highlight that this may need a, a remedy. So when you find yourself questioning certain things where you say, I wish this worked better or this particular aspect of it sucks, sucks so bad that I would like a better solution. That is a very appropriate time for you to start writing down in a small piece of notebook where you can say this could mean that I could talk to others and see if they experience similar things. And then after having spoken to about 10 to 15 people, if all of them have identified similar problems, then that means that you've, you've come across a potential problem to solve. The second way, if you're, if you're in a leadership position in, in your enterprises, for example, instead of asking for people for ideas to contribute to organizations to solve it is much better to ask them for identifying problems that they have usually humans are much more prone and easy going to tell you about the problems that they have on a daily basis but it's very hard for them to say or talk about ideas for for solving those particular problems so if you're in an enterprise and if you're in a leadership position, one of the key ways to encourage people within your enterprise or have a group of friends talk about how to come up with a problem uh, statement is generally ask them in your day to life, day, day to day life, what is it that you wish that could be solved? What are the problems that you're having so that you could have a conversation around that, that topic? And usually the best way to come up with, uh, with problems is to be self-aware this is this is where often you saw that a particular thing has not been working well and it has been there for a significant amount of time if you look back at your careers and if things have not changed many and you have seen other industries working better for example an analog industry could be an airline industry 
in which certain things have changed for better and you don't see that happening that self awareness is potentially a place where you could capture these problem statements and think of it from if i solve this particular problem are there customers who are willing to pay for it can it be a repeated solution can it be a scalable solution as well so first become self aware about your surroundings about your work styles about things that you wish that you could solve on a daily basis the second is question status quo one of the things that we don't do often is we tend to accept it as 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 our fate for example if you have repeatedly identified a particular problem that hurts the way you work for example if you're able if you're going into a into a port and if you're asked, if you're being asked for a lot of documentation that primarily impacts your your ability to safely navigate or spend time on a maintain on the maintenance of the vessel that is probably the time to raise that question stating this is not something that i'm not i'm supposed to do i'm supposed to be focusing upon my primary responsibilities of maintenance and navigation and this paperwork or this regulatory compliance bit impedes into my day to day lifestyle and question the the right authorities to be able to say can we do something about this and if they don't and if you repeatedly have enterprises that fail you for that expectation that potentially also is an opportunity for you to solve it yourself with with a group of like minded people once you're able to identify the circumstances in 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 documenting the problems how do you develop an eye for solutions the first and foremost is the best way to get acceptance to what your problem statement is is by sharing you obviously have a very close knit community that is one of the things that i love about this industry is how close knit the seafarer community is if you're able to articulate the problem that you've experienced or if you're able to articulate the idea that you have for a for a future state please share that with your colleagues please bring it up in a way in which you can talk about that problem statements to get validation first it may not necessarily lead to solutions but at least it will give you the assurance that you're not the only one who's experiencing this particular problem but be aware of this sometimes when we look at problems and jump to conclusions we may not necessarily identify the solutions that we want and may not be the most optimal solutions that we want to build given the amount of technology that's available so this is a great quote by henry ford when when somebody asked him about cars he said if i had spoken to thousands of people when we had no cars they would have said i i needed faster horses not faster cars or a better way to transportation that's that's a that, that's something that you'll have to be very aware of is when you identify a problem the solution that you i that you fix shouldn't necessarily become another problem for for you to solve it has to be something that is substantially done better 10x better it should be a solution that hopefully nobody has thought about so that in the startup world you have you have innovation playing a part in your success the best way to think about this is these these startups they're, they're no longer startups they're giants right now but if you think about it 10 years before before where we are today ubers netflix amazons and airbnbs were were small companies that were just about coming up and the and the amount of transformation that they've brought in our consumer lives can only be explained by a common function that they all have and the framework is very simple the framework is think of it about what is it that you want when do you want that particular thing and how do you want it and when you combine these three simple questions together you will start seeing a pattern of what uber does what amazon does what netflix does let's take one of the examples like uber previously we had to order a taxi we had to either telephone a taxi company and essentially wait for it and not necessarily know in real time as to where that taxi is the not knowing element of it is what frustrated us as humans because there was no visibility into the equation now with uber what do you want i want a taxi which can accommodate six people when do you want it i want it 30 minutes from now how do you want it 
I want it three blocks away from my house because that's where the rest of my friends are. And I'm going to walk up there. This ability to customize and configure it to your enterprise needs or an individual's needs is extremely powerful about thinking about how you provide solutions for your problems. Now, if you translate this to the maritime world, how, how can you apply that same framework? The best way to do it is to start looking about as seafarers, what are your daily experiences and the, the enterprises that you work for, what are their expectations? Typically, one of the things that you often have to keep aware of or be aware of is a business has certain expectations of how your work should be delivered. And by doing that, on a daily basis, what are your experiences? Are you being frustrated or are you, are you concerned about a certain uh, style of working? These elements of it are extremely critical. Let me give some specific examples. Let's say a, a maritime enterprise wants operational visibility. Obviously, vessels are a, are a, are a very asset heavy industry. And for a shipping company to invest anywhere between 30 to 50 to 70 million dollars on this asset means that every shipping company wants operational visibility of what is going on. Now, when we talk to seafarers, they talk about that same operational visibility, implying a lot of reporting and a lot of documentation. Now, that is friction where on one end enterprise wants visibility, whereas that same requirement or an expectation is causing a different set of experiences on the vessel where you have to now fill in a lot of documentation which which takes away time from your primary duties the second is compliance versus regulatory burden now obviously all the institutions and the regulatory bodies that that introduce compliance is to ensure that every enterprise operates on the same legal scale as as possible as well as they operate under safe conditions Whereas when they introduce ever-changing compliance regulations, it contributes to direct burden and the way seafarers operate in the vessels. Is there an opportunity for you to find a middle ground where while you comply, you also reduce these burdens? So that, that, that's another, another potential opportunity for you to think about problem and solution statements. The third is, this is a very, hard industry it's, it's also quite dangerous if you don't necessarily take care of your vessel are there areas in which you can also operate safe and and maintainable conditions without necessarily losing on time today every time when you speak to seafarers they talk about how for you to maintain these voyages in safe and maintain conditions you need to have more time and that time time is all going away and complying with regulation paperwork or having to prepare for your port arrivals and uh, and and so on and so forth if you if you were given enough time what are the areas that you can contribute into managing a highly safe and a highly maintained vessel so that enterprises could benefit from the bottom line of this these three could potentially give you some ideas about how maritime startups are coming into foray because a lot of them fall in those three buckets is how do i increase the operational visibility of an asset or how do i help maritime enterprises as well as seafarers to be able to become compliant by not necessarily compri compromising on on the on the on the quality of it as well as helping them from a reducing the burden of compliance and the third is what do i do in terms of increasing the safety and maintenance of these vessels I've been fortunate to to follow a few companies now and and these are some of the companies that are, that I've I've shortlisted here for you to take a look at it as to how people within the industry have identified certain set of problems so this is a company called C miles and they call themselves industry's first incentivization platform the problem that they wish to solve is how do you identify star performers in the enterprise when within within a shipping company if there are hundreds of seafarers and seafaring in generally is a very tough job how do i identify staff performers and how do you reward these staff performers 
a, a gentleman in the industry noticed that this was a very hard thing for most enterprises to do and he understood that this, that's a problem statement that's spread across the entire industry so he created c miles where by accumulating the number of miles that you put in when you go from point a to point b enterprises could use that those journeys to to reward you and you could spend these miles as if you do for for airline miles so that's the reason why the name c miles came into play the second is this company called nmo so this was started by a gentleman who was a chief engineer in the past and his way of looking at it was as humans we can get an ecg done when we have certain things wrong for example if you wanted to get a heart checked up we could simply go to a doctor and he would plug in a few cables to our, uh, our our chest and and be able to get the right readings and tell you the condition of our heart the best part about an ecg is that it's not invasive there's no injections there's nothing uh, uh, surgical that needs to be done it's just a simple device that that is plugged into our uh, to our chest and and you get the appropriate readings he looked at that possibility of of doing something similar for machines and he invented a device which could be just plugged in to the wires that the electrical wires that are coming out of your equipment and based upon these he he gets readings and analyzes them using machine learning and tells you before an equipment can fail so this is somebody who understood as a chief engineer what his problems were and identify a truly scalable way to solve that particular problem the third company that i'm aware of is this company called clog which believes seafarers have to carry a lot of documentation on vessels this is all today done using paper this potential risks of losing that paperwork which may cause a lot of grief because you'll have to go back to your home countries again to to get this paperwork done so instead of all of this can this paperwork be now digitized put it into a blockchain and give you simply a crew id where all you share to a potential enterprise that you want to engage in the future this crew id where that crew id could extract all the relevant documentation uh, that you wish to share and and they can verify that remotely and so this is a very secure this is a very transparent and it's the most efficient way to ensure that data collaboration can be made simple the fourth that i've run into is this company called spoolify now shipping is a very complex industry it also involves a lot of stakeholders and it's also a global industry now when you go to a certain part of the world and you have a, a particular problem with your vessel a, 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 an engine is down or you have to overhaul a certain thing how do you ident identify which resources in those areas work first so they basically put together a, an artificial intelligence platform to create a marketplace where you can bring in the service jobs understand what these jobs may require as skills and pop up the right skill sets so that you can contact these people to be done in the most productive cost and efficient way in terms of gains so these three are this is again being done by somebody from the industry these are four typical startups that have just come out in the last eight to ten months but this is this is where the industry is heading so this is a picture from 2020 it's from a very respectable source called kongsberg which most of you might be aware of and they published this where each category whether it's administration or performance management or maintenance there are hundreds of startup companies that have evolved to essentially look at challenging problems to solve and this gives a great way for most of you on this call to get engaged with it with with any of these startups so that it plays a significant role in uh, in your careers as well as you can draw inspiration from any of these to to potentially start up some of your own and you have a lot of support right now and the best way to depict why this industry has been really attracting a lot of startups is to show you this graph if you notice the last five years 2015 to 2020 there's a complete race so this is just a graph formed in north america where incubators which typically take a young startup and coach them as to how 
their startup can be successful or an accelerator where you have a certain amount of idea you also have a product and you go to an accelerator to essentially get as many contacts as possible in the industry and accelerate your growth incubators and accelerators have been truly skyrocketing in most of the regions in singapore there are at least 10 of them that i am aware of in in north america you can see it's already exceeded 30 and in europe it's the same case this is an industry that truly has has come out of uh, shadows and 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 looked at how startups can can truly drive the digital transformation that it desires. Thetius is is an organization that's based out of UK as well as Startup What. So if you visit these sites, you'd be able to identify which incubators and accelerators are active, as well as you can reach out to each one of them to understand what is it that they're doing, which startups are they accepting. What are some of the key areas and key focus areas that they want startups to emerge and solve problems into? For example, decarbonization is a great area because of the pollution that's like, that exists. Because of the IMO 2020 regulation, there are, there are several problems to be solved, including scrubbers, which are being put in the, for the first time. There are a lot of low-hanging fruits, like, for example, paper documentation that, that still is is the most common way 90% of the industry still continues to use. So all these ideas that are there, you can position yourself to at least talk to these incubators and accelerators and identify ways to engage with them so that you can, you can truly get involved in this uh, entire segment. And the best way that I felt that you could get started is at a minimum, start documenting. For example, in our case, when we wanted to reach out to a few people, for us, it's important to be talking to people that have previously been experiencing similar conditions of, of, of frustration or discontent. And the best way to exhibit and exhibit your knowledge to the world is to start documenting them in a blog. We've also been fortunate to talk to some people who've literally documented their lifestyles on the vessels or their lifestyles on the shores as to what is it that they do on a daily basis in a video log. This may be a great way to, one, document it for yourself. Two, if there is a potential startup that you wish to be found by, we could simply search and, and, and get to you and, and start a potential partnership in place. The second is preferably, if you have a burning idea or a problem that you really think it's worthy to solve, start up on your own. And the best part about doing it in this day and age is that access to technology has become ubiquitous. You don't have to also spend a whole lot of money to access this technology. And if you come from a non-technical background, you could simply reach out to technology partners which specialize in working with idea stage companies and help you paint a picture as to what your product's gonna look like with a very limited set of money. And after that, you can start talking to more partners to showcase your vision. The third is look at ways to get involved with startups. So I just showed you a, a landscape picture in which comfortably there are at least 200 to 250 startups that are operating practically across the entire global, uh, global country landscape. You can simply write to them, talk about the experience and the time that you have spent in the industry and get engaged on a on a on, on times when you potentially are taking a break from your leg, regular schedules or more formally get engaged in terms of commitment of, of 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 some time like 10 to 20 hours a week so that you understand one what they're doing and they could leverage your expertise in in ensuring that they build solutions for the end customers the way end customers should experience third is when you have ideas don't keep it to yourself make sure you open it up you talk to your trusted friends in the industry there are a lot of mentors in your industry that can take some of these ideas and and help you flush it out so that you could make something bigger out of it and and most importantly don't hesitate to reach out to startups and and pose your questions so that collaboration can really be a driving force in introducing innovation in our industry and I can, I, I, I can take any questions from this point on. Thanks, David. Thank you very much, uh, Surendra. 
Um, that, that was fascinating. Um, let me just do a couple buttons here. Right, so uh, before we start in on the Q&A, and, and we do have about 20 minutes for Q&A, and the questions have been coming in, so thank you very much, uh, all those uh, who, who have been paying attention. Uh, just a couple comments. Yes, Captain uh, Sajith um, is no, not able to be with us. Uh, it explains why his face is up there. Um, uh, he's a very innovative uh, captain um, and has worked with uh, Surendra, which is what brought us together. He's also on our uh, council, Nautical Institute Council, and we really hoped he could have been here, but he is at sea and he could not get a connection, so he sends his apologies. But he should be the one asking the, the really interesting questions, so I'll, I'll, I'll do it in his place. Right, the other thing to note is that a number of you have had trouble downloading the um, handout called Incubators, Accelerators, and Investors. Um, sorry about that. Um, it is a single page poster that is copied from slide number 40 in the presentation. So if you cannot download that document or the presentation, uh, which is available as a handout, uh, let me know uh, using the questions and I will send you a copy afterwards. But it is just a, a, a one page slide copy of um, slide number 40. Right, so um, where do we start? Uh, let's be disruptive. So we, we've got a question and it says that startups are often referred to as disrupt, disrupt, disruptors or disruptive technology. Is that a bad thing? Surrender. No, it's certainly not a bad thing. Uh, I think uh, disruption in general is referred to when a smaller company with a fewer resources are challenging existing incumbents. So it's not that existing enterprises cannot necessarily solve the same problems that startups are solving. Startups require you to think differently and, and having the mindset to, to look at problems in a way in which you could use fewer resources and less amount of time to be able to focus and solve it with passion. That's what disruption is, and, and startups do it on a day-in and day-out basis, and it's certainly not a bad thing. No, I, 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 and I think that's a very interesting point. And um, uh, one, of the, one of the challenges, one, one of the things that we find in maritime is that mariners are often their own worst enemies because they make things work. That they, they're, they're very creative at finding jury rigs. And if that creativeness can be turned into a more standard approach of solving a problem, that would be fantastic. And I'd love for somebody to disrupt the amount of bureaucracy and paperwork that mariners have to do. That would be a truly wonderful thing. So I've got another question from Alexander here. He says, uh, I've only used plain Excel to make printable reports for oil transfer, draft surveys, passage plans, compass error, um, and intercept requirements, uh, only time and DR inputs. Uh, formulas and formatting are easy in Excel, but it's hard to monetize this. What should I upskill in in order to monetize my programs? So uh, the first thing that you need to look at is, is this something that's applicable one to whatever you're solving currently for one enterprise? And can that same solution that you have it in Excel be made available to, let's say, hundreds of enterprises? Let's assume that that to be the case. The second is for you to be able to develop such a software, it's not necessary that you'd have to be adept in writing software itself. The beauty about technology evolution is that there's something called no-code software development right now. I could refer, I, I could uh, send out a list of no-code software tools. So these are basically platforms that allow you to 
mimic the same behavior that you have developed in soft in Excel, which usually sits or in your desktop unless you share it with somebody on an ex, or on an email. You can translate everything that you've been able to do in Excel into a cloud-based software. And, and after you have built this cloud-based software, you can now provide access to multiple enterprises for a small fee that you can monetize upon. So number one is write it down in a methodical fashion as to how you solve it in Excel. Two, look at no code. So this is N-O-C-O-D-E. So this is basically saying, I don't have to write any software code to be able to build tools and platforms. You could use these to replicate what you've been able to do in Excel. And because you've done it on no code platforms, which usually is a web platform and you, it's behind a username and password, you could offer that as a solution to more than one enterprise for a small exchange of, uh, of time and money that you spend. Okay, uh, thank you, that, that, that's good advice. Um, we've got another question here from uh, Brendan, and he says, uh, you, you mentioned about sharing your ideas and mentors and you know, getting the message out there and blogs, but he says, with regard to sharing ideas, is this risky? How can we go about this without losing uh, your idea? In other words, the uh, intellectual property. It's it's rarely that ideas make money. It's it's always the execution that makes money. So you know, just sharing ideas doesn't necessarily mean you'd you'd have to be you'd have to be aware that a startup or any enterprise is only successful when you take an idea, you combine it with the right resources, you'd have to combine it with, uh, with, with a solution in place and, and potentially go and market it to several enterprises before you can call yourself a successful uh, startup or an enterprise. And the last thing that one should be doing is, is keeping everything to themselves because you don't necessarily get the validation for your thoughts unless you start sharing with people. Now, in terms of IP protection, there are certain tools that are available if you feel overtly scared about sharing these things. So you should at least talk about what is the problem that you're solving and what is the potential solution that you wish to create without necessarily giving away the secret sauce. If, if you go to any incubator, if you go to any accelerator, one of the key things that they mention is ideas are a dime a dozen. It's the whole process of taking that idea, executing it into a successful solution that counts. And I would, I would absolutely encourage everybody to start thinking about how they can share without necessarily compromising upon something, something very, you know, very special about what they wish to do. Okay, thank you. Um, the questions are coming thick and fast now. Um, this one is Petter. Uh, could you please describe your views on importance of improving of the web data flow from ship to shore communication as a clue uh, point in further progress in maritime industry? So I, I think what he's saying is, um, is the sometimes weak signal transfer between ship and shore a hindrance um, or can you have startups that don't need the full bandwidth? Fortunately, this is an area of, uh, of, of great evolution, at least in the last couple of years. I had read uh, an article recently uh, in November of 2019, I think, from Inmarsat, where they said in 2015, hardly 50 MB of data was getting transferred between ship and shore. Uh, and, and now that, that same amount has, has gone up hundreds of times. So I think it's now reached to somewhere around 5 GB per day. So in terms of the, the connectivity itself, of course, there are still challenges. The bandwidth is slow, but in terms of where we were a few years ago to where we are now is different. And it's certainly a problem that's going to completely go away uh, in, in a couple of years from now because of the ambition that we have in terms of remotely managing and monitoring these vessels uh, for, the, for, the, for the long uh, journey that we have towards reaching autonomous. So from a connectivity perspective, it is, it is a problem that is going to be short term and certainly will get solved. In terms of how you use that network bandwidth, there are certainly startups that are solving, including, including the one that I'm doing right now, focuses upon taking the data that is getting generated on a daily basis and finding ways to efficiently transfer 
so that people on the shore get as much visibility as they want in, in near real time basis. Okay, uh, thank you. And here, here's one along a, a similar thread. And this has actually come up a, a, a couple times, but I'll, I'll read out the question by um, Lalit. It says, how can I become a member of any startup so that I can earn more money in this pandemic situation as I work from home as an option? So there's the Absolutely. other side. <laughs> Absolutely. It's actually it, it, it's beneficial for both sides. Uh, one of the things that any startup should be doing when they're, when they're developing solutions is to give these solutions to the actual people who end up using. So, for example, if I'm if I'm a startup and I'm often engaged with people on the shore or the decision makers who often are executive level people. Uh, they only look at the value proposition that we develop, whereas the actual utilization of the software itself is going to be for the gentleman who's on the vessel that I don't have or I have very limited access to. So in that regard, if there are several of you who currently are on your break where you come in for a few months uh, to your homes, you're certainly welcome to reach out and talk about what is it that you can, uh, you're certainly interested in to work with this startup. And on the other hand, the startup can also utilize your time to give you the software and ask you right questions to say would you appreciate or have uh, any questions about the solution that we provide that end user validation is extremely important and for that there'll be several startups that would be very keen to engage with uh, with time and con obviously compensate for you for that as well okay uh, thank you very much um, next question from uh, captain subroto is ai artificial intelligence uh, going to be uh, incorporated uh, with your startup to enhance the features? If yes, uh, how will you be able to go about it? So do good startups now require AI? It's, <laughs> that's a, it, it's a good to have. It's not a precursor of any startup to be able to say that only AI uh, startups will be able to thrive. Uh, before before we talk about even artificial intelligence, I think the most important thing for you to think about is two key aspects is how do I generate data? Because artificial intelligence is only valuable if you have lots of data that you're able to parse through and understand and, and, and look for patterns that could be solved. And before you reach that stage, the, the critical elements that one needs to follow is what are the problems that you could solve today that could elevate your access to data? Once you're able to have access to data, how can you then make it accessible to multiple parties to harness the value out of that data? And by looking at these patterns, you then would be able to apply AI. In our case, we certainly are looking and, and it's a roadmap item for us to, to incorporate AI, but it's certainly not a precursor for a, a startup to be successful. Okay, um, while we're talking about AI and autonomous AI. things, Leslie asks, do you think autonomous ships are a good startup? Now, I'll, I'll, I've got my own thoughts on this, but over to you for the first. I, I, I think the whole term of autonomous, at least personally to me, means it is, it is being operate. The machines are autonomous, not necessarily autonomous ships ships mean no humans on on board it's 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 a journey that one has to undertake it certainly is something that's probably going to happen 10 to 15 years from now but but i don't i don't necessarily think that autonomous means completely humans out of the picture now is that a startup can can an autonomous ship be created by startup i i think that takes a lot of resources that takes a lot of collaboration so so it's it's going to be a, a joint effort between enterprises and startups to be able to arrive at that that you sort of utopia where we are able to do autonomous ships right I, I, it's 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 not going to be one company that's going to come out with a solution it's not going to be one startup it's not going to be one enterprise it's going to be the entire industry collaborating with each other to understand what is it that we wish to have that autonomous ship do for us and 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 then get there Okay, uh, thank you. Um, I'll, I'll give a little input from, from, from my side on this as well. Uh, at the Nautical Institute, we've um, 
uh, we've been working fairly closely with some of the um, uh, autonomous um, enterprises. And as Mr. Lynn Gardy said in his presentation, it's got to solve a problem. Um, and there are thousands of autonomous craft, surface craft, out there on the water as we speak. Um, they do tend to be small at the moment, um, uh, and their uh, main use is in data gathering, uh, whether that be surveying uh, the seabed for uh, renewable energy installations, whether it be monitoring temperature and plastics in the ocean, whether it be uh, doing uh, high quality hydrographic surveys, uh, but these are all applications that probably would not get done if you needed a manned vessel to do it. So there was a very clear business case to solve a problem. Um, so from an autonomous ship point of view, yes, there will be applications where there is a very clear business um, case to bring that in, and it's, it's happening now. Um, the other side of it, is autonomous systems, increasingly autonomous systems, on manned vessels. And this is where the Nautical Institute is particularly concerned, because the interface between autonomous systems on manned vessels and um, it, that interface is very important, uh, because it's very easy to get wrong. It's probably a lot more difficult to get right. But when you do get it right, and the technology, the automation supports the humans on board, well, it could be fantastic. And mariners have already benefited hugely from autonomous systems monitoring and reacting on board vessels uh, that could give them a greater capability. So um, is there an environment for some uh, startup thinking in that area? I think there is. And I think a, a lot of mariners if they look closely at what they do on board and what could be made better through autonomous, yes, that is the seed, that is the start of a startup. But as uh, Surrender said, the thought doesn't make the money. It's getting that thought to the people who can you know, work with it, to the enterprise that ends up making it a successful business. Right. Um, so the looking at, at, at the time where we're, we're getting a little bit uh, close to the end. Um, startups are often associated with small and lean organizations. What are the opportunities for mariners having this experience at sea to find in, to find employment or engagement with startups? You, you, you talked a little bit about that, um, you know, finding a a company that works with startups and then saying, I'm a seafarer, what do you need to know? But is there is there any other advice? I think, yeah, absolutely. I think in terms of uh, uh, whole engagement itself, I, I, I believe the best way to to address for the entire industry is if the industry itself collaborates. And, and for technology folks like us, we always look for experienced personnel to make sense of the data. For example, one of the things that we are, are doing at this point is to digitize engine logs and get the engine logs to the, the, the shipping company that, uh, that basically engages with us. Now to make sense of this, often I have to talk to a chief engineer and, and chief engineers have much more deeper insight of, of the data that's coming out of, of the logs. And, and that's one example in which they could simply collaborate with a startup and contribute what are the things that one should be observing. You can take that from every perspective. You can, you can look at master mariners, for example, who got a lot of exposure going across the world, understanding some of the challenges when they enter into third world countries like India, for example, with a lot of documentation challenges as to how is it that they could help somebody uh, like a startup who's trying to solve these problems to build better solutions. And the only way any startup can build better solutions is by talking to subject matter experts at it. And if you feel you're a subject matter expert, you should certainly encourage uh, your, your wisdom to be shared with, uh, with this to build a better solution. 
Okay, thanks, Sandra. Um, again, with, with my eye on the clock, uh, I, I did promise to try to wrap this up within a, a, an hour. Uh, there, there are other questions, and it's always a um, uh, conundrum uh, what, what, how long to, to continue. Uh, we can try to continue some of these ideas in, in, in writing afterwards, but I think I, I probably will wrap, wrap this up. Um, a lot of the questions that came in were about who do I contact? And um, we did put up in the slides, um, uh, I think it was that slide number 40, all those organizations uh, that can be contacted. And Mr. Leon Garrity um, can also be contacted. You, you have his contact address there. Um, if you like this sort of conversation, um, this is where the Nautical Institute is putting a, a lot of our efforts into you know, in not only improving the industry with things like startup tools, but also how do we educate and enable our members to think this way and engage in this new, um, uh, this the new future that, that is coming rapidly upon us. So um, if you become a member, we are a membership organization. We have a journal, Seaways, many other publications. Um, uh, please do consider it if you're not already a member. Uh, I noticed that many of you are, so that, that that's great. I hope you see this as a valuable service. Um, a recording of this webinar will be available probably later today on our YouTube channel. So go to uh, YouTube and type in the Nautical Institute and you'll find our channel with not only this video, but uh, many others that we've done. Um, some of you have asked how big of an audience do we have here? Uh, we had uh, over 350 uh, people registered to participate, so that's great. A lot of interest in this. And I think that's about it. So, uh, Mr. Leon Garrity, thank you so much for your time and effort, uh, your expertise, your clarity about describing um, what startups are, both the technology side and the thought side. Um, thank you for that wonderful slide that shows all the um, incubators and accelerators uh, that are available for Maritime. And um, thank you very much. So what I'll do is just because of the way the software works, I'll invite you to log off and then I will end the session for everybody. So thank you all for your um, uh, attendance and your interest and your stimulating questions. Uh, so from the Nautical Institute, that's it for us. Thank you. Thank you so much for the honor, David. Thank My you, everyone. Pleasure. Bye.